As we stockpile food and supplies, hold our families close, and isolate ourselves in our bunkers of solitude, I want to offer a glimmer of hope. The world is coming together in an unprecedented way to wage war against this common enemy. And thanks to increased global investments in medical breakthroughs and scientific research, we're winning. Due to scientific progress in gene sequencing, scientists were able to sequence the coronavirus faster than ever before in history. And scientists around the world were able to share information and promptly begin working on treatments and vaccines. As of March 16th, the Kaiser Permanente Washington Research Institute in Seattle has begun human testing on an experimental vaccine. And an immunologist at Johns Hopkins University is experimenting with the use of antibodies from recovered COVID-19 patients for use in a potential treatment of the virus. Australian researchers at the University of Queensland's Center for Clinical Research have developed two drugs which wiped out all traces of the disease in test tubes, and they're now beginning testing on a nationwide trial. And Dutch and Canadian researchers have collaborated and managed to isolate the agent responsible for the spread of COVID-19, which will give researchers around the world better insights into the biology, evolution, and clinical shedding of the virus, and hopefully speed up the development of treatments and vaccines, as well as help researchers to develop better diagnostic testing. This is what we as humans can accomplish when we value and invest in science, when we work together to solve the greatest problems facing the human race. We will overcome. We can accomplish great things. And we can make prompt and effective progress. But before you take that for granted, I'd like to shine a little bit of light on the alternative pathway before us. The U.S. religious response in the last month of this upbreak has been interesting. We've seen religious pseudoscience rear its ugly head in an unprecedented way. As the National Institutes of Health was predicting that as many as potentially 1.5 million deaths in the U.S. alone could occur if drastic measures weren't taken, and as the CDC was begging people to stay home and practice social distancing, how were church leaders responding? Well, the author, international public speaker, and self-proclaimed apostolic prophet, Jennifer LeClaire, encouraged her congregation to not heed the CDC's advice, but to gather together in prayer. Because we don't run away and isolate ourselves and quarantine ourselves and sit in our houses simply because we're afraid. We run to the church and we take authority over this demonic entity that's invading our city. We get all of us here praying together and ain't none of us gonna get attacked by this dumb thing. But she was far from the only pastor with such catastrophically stupid faith-based advice. And as unemployment has begun to skyrocket, who's been there to bilk the desperate out of their last dime other than multi-millionaire prosperity doctrine preachers like Trump's evangelical advisor, Kenneth Copeland, who told his viewers that, Whatever you do right now, don't you stop tithing. Mm. Don't you stop sowing offerings. Well, they won't let us go to church. Well, email it in there, text to give or something, but you get your tithe in that church. If you have to go take it down there and drop it off and unstick it under the door or something, right, you right. get that tithe in that church, you get that offering in that church, and then you go home and you do what we're supposed to do. And you have some fancy clothes. I, I mean, do. for a pastor, you are living yes. a life of luxury. Yes, you've am. got great homes, you've got yes, great planes, you, you drive in limos. I'm a and very wealthy man. You're a very wealthy man. Yes. My wealth doesn't come from offerings alone. Because you sell things, books and DVDs. Yes, and I have a lot of natural gas on our property. Didn't know that, did you, babe? Now I do. Yeah, you do. Isn't that wonderful? You right. get that tithe in that church. You get that offering in that church. Or Trump's other multimillionaire is spiritual advisor, Paula White, who painted her church as the essential hospital for the spiritually sick. We are a hospital for those who are soul sick. Before asking her increasingly unemployed congregants to send her $91 donations. Maybe you'd like to sow a $91 seed. And that's just putting your faith with Psalm 91 or maybe $9 or whatever God tells you to do. Meanwhile, she lives in a mansion. Now is not the time to abandon your covenant with God. It's the time that you go deeper. Thousands of pastors forgetting about the Black Death, bubonic plague, Spanish flu, smallpox, polio, SARS, MERS, H1N1, Ebola, etc., which we have survived all of, have warned their congregations that this, this right here is the end times, which totally didn't instill panic in anyone. At least though, 
Pastor Chuck Pierce was there to reassure people that this wasn't the end times, just yet at least, because he's a prophet and God has shown him at least through the year 2026. This would almost be comical if so many people weren't so tragically affected by holy incompetence. And it's not just in the U.S. This religious menagerie isn't just limited to the borders of the United States, known for its young earth creationist museums, life-size Noah's Ark recreations, and Appalachian snake handling pastors. Religious incompetence and scientific illiteracy is a global pandemic. As far flung as South Africa, spiritual healers were going door to door distributing their flyers for their traditional herbalist snake oil salesman services, telling people that if you're out of work because of COVID, can't afford to go to a hospital, no worries. For just a small fee, you can obtain a protection of charms, which is about as effective as a bulletproof vest made entirely of saran wrap. As the coronavirus spread through South Korea, Pastor Lee Man Hee, claiming to be the second coming of Jesus, decided to throw caution to the wind and ignore safety advisories. After his congregation was exposed to the virus, he then thwarted efforts to stop its spread by refusing to hand over a list of his church's members to the authorities. At the beginning of the month, over 60% of the 4,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Korea were members of his cult. He blamed the spread of the disease on evil. I agree. And as the coronavirus ravaged the city of Qom, their local cleric Ayatollah Tabrizian denounced Western medicine as un-Islamic and joined the hunbots of the MLM world recommending the halal alternative, smearing essential oils on your anus. Which would be hilarious, except for the fact that in the wake of the pseudoscientific religious advice, the virus has become such a problem in Iran that now someone is dying of COVID-19 every 10 minutes there. But at least grandma's corpse will smell like violet leaf oil. Meanwhile, Orthodox Jews in Beit Shemesh, Israel, ignored rules about social distancing. Hundreds of school kids gathered together declaring, we're not scared, and sexist religious posters outside blamed the pandemic on their women wearing wigs made entirely of non-Jewish hair. How incredibly unkosher. But it's not just the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians. As we hunker down in our homes around the world trying to weather the storm and not spread the disease, Mormon congregations told their missionaries that this was an excellent time to go catch people in their homes and encouraged missionaries to go door to door knocking, even calling on some of their most vulnerable elderly patriarchs to bounce home to home delivering blessings. We don't want them to spread their blessings to us. But nonetheless, they continue to take part in what I'm dubbing the Lord's contagion. As hundreds of thousands contract the potentially life-ending virus, their loved ones turn to God with prayers of intercession. If they recover, he's clearly good, loving, and gracious. If they die, well, he's just being mysterious again. The virus kills indiscriminately, though. It doesn't care what faith or creed you are. It doesn't care which gods you pray to. The only thing that's stopping it is scientific research into cures and vaccines and the spread of science-based preventative information. And uh, don't think you get a pass, Hindus. As India quarantined itself off from the rest of the world, Hindu activists held cow urine drinking parties where they guzzled the sacred kidney elixir of their bovine brethren. Holy cow. <laughs> and one of the countries that was hit hardest by the virus has been Italy. As the health departments there took drastic measures to curb the COVID outbreak, the Pope, the world's most useless geriatric billionaire, staring down at the empty streets of the Vatican, assured Catholics around the world that he had met with God on his pilgrimage down the street to no less than two different churches, where he asked God to please stop the virus now. <laughs> Unfortunately, per usual, God seems to be practicing social distancing. When thrust under the black light of scrutiny, we see the harmful traces of religious pseudoscience everywhere. And we have to ask ourselves, how have we been so complacent and comfortable with the spread of this mind virus? Religious insanity is a global pandemic. I understand that people are scared and they want reassurance in these uncertain times that things are going to be okay. People turn to prophets and psychics for words of insight about the, what the future holds, and time and time again, they're disappointed by charlatans and swindlers. But humanity will pull through this. We're strong and resilient. And what's more, we have a tremendous chance to learn from this going forward. This 
This right here is an inflection point, a learning opportunity. As humanity bands together to find a cure and overcome this pandemic ravaging our planet, perhaps the loved ones that we lose won't have to die in vain. If and only if we can emerge from this with valuable lessons learned about the failure of spiritual superstition, prayer, and faith healing, and the danger of pseudoscience and religious dogma, exiting this dark tunnel with a newfound appreciation of the importance of scientific literacy and for our collective investment in education, medicine, vaccines, and other research and development initiatives. This is the only sane path forward. The alternative is grim. If we shamefully refuse to learn from past mistakes, we doom ourselves to swan dive our heads back into the dark age sand dunes, shoulder deep in religious and superstitious insanity. It's an easy choice. Human lives and the rate of human progress hang in the balance. The consequences have never been more dire, but the simultaneously empowering and terrifying reality is that this vital choice for humanity's trajectory is entirely up to us.